During the Great Freeze of 1683, possibly the coldest winter in Britain's history, cattle were freezing to death and the shortages of firewood meant that rich and poor alike were doing the same. But there was one place where a jollier atmosphere prevailed during this deadly cold snap, and that was on the frozen River Thames, which was home to a sprawling carnival-like frost fair, which began today in history. And it wasn't the first documented frost fair in a devastating blow to our format. Um, (laughs) The problem with that one is it didn't happen in the build-up to Christmas and we wanted to find Christmas dates this week. (laughs) So we've chosen to focus on this one, which did happen on the 20th of December. But actually, there had been eight frost fairs before this, which is when the traders and the public of London would take to the frozen over river to ply their trade. But this was a famous one, the Blanket Fair, they called it, because, as you said, Rebecca, even the seas of southern Britain were frozen solid for up to two miles from shore in this cold snap. Yeah, the uh, the frost had really begun back in November. And by this time, you already had the ability for the stalls to begin to be set up, which hadn't been the case every year. It was actually so utterly freezing that people were by this stage actually sort of skating up and down the river and using it as a form of, you know, another highway to get through the city. Yeah, some of the earlier frost fairs, it seemed like they were actually mostly being used to transport goods and for people to cross by foot or on a horse or car. They weren't stopping to have fun necessarily. It was just, you know, in those days, you only had London Bridge really in in what we would call central London. So it was just a convenient way to cross the ice. It seems like it was kind of in the Elizabethan times that they were like, wait, 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 we could stop on the ice and we could do something fun on there. So apparently during the 1564 Frost Fair, Queen Elizabeth herself played at archery on the ice. Uh, And then this carried on. I found this account of one from 1608 Mm -hmm. by a guy called John Chamberlain. He wrote to a friend saying that, Many fantastical experiments are daily put in practice. As certain use burnt a gallon of wine upon the ice and made all the passengers partakers. But the best is of an honest woman, they say, that had a great longing to have her husband get her with child upon the Thames. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really good time that they had on the ice. <laughs> trying to think what the frozen Thames equivalent of the Mile High Club would be. <laughs> um, Charles II took to the Frost Fair on this day. Apparently did a a fox hunt on the ice, according to one biographer. Um, (laughs) Partly because it was fun, but also partly I think there was a responsibility on the monarch to show the public that this was an entertainment that they Mm. should be doing. And the reason for that was there was a huge fiscal penalty to the national economy when the Thames froze over. It was... The main tributary, obviously, for London, but that was what made London the major capital city of Europe. Without that, you had not only a detriment to all of the restaurants and all of the public houses and all of the hospitality in London that wasn't getting access to fresh ingredients, but all of the traders who brought it in literally didn't have a job. So, you know, this was giving them another opportunity to do something else, do a tour on the ice or something. Yeah, and particularly hard hit were the watermen, who were the people who transported both goods, but also passengers from one side of the river to the other, or even up and down the river. Charles's involvement was partly charitable. He he came along and uh, suggested that they might like to support these people who were now completely out of work because there was no such thing as ice men. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, that sort of established a secondary purpose because the primary purpose it seems to me seems to have been drinking on the ice that (laughs) that seems to be the main thing that was going on I think that might have been the primary purpose of any entertainment in 1683 (laughs) regardless of where it's happening and the watermen were running these attractions they built the booths out of sailcloth that they weren't using they attached sledges to the hulls of their boats to create a fun way of transporting passengers over the river in fact one of these sledge boats was actually used as basically a fairground attraction it was tethered to a pole and then it was hurled around in circles by burly Dutchman creating a ride that was called the Dutch Whimsy. (laughs) Kind of sounds like a disease. Yeah, there's a dizzying range of things you could do. Uh, Here's a diarist from the time, John Evelyn, quote, Sleds, sliding with skates, bull baiting, horse and coach races, puppet plates and interludes, cocks, tippling, and other lewd places. What does that mean? (laughs) So that it seemed to be a Bacchanalian triumph or carnival on the water. I wouldn't know where to start with that. I want to do all of that. It's like writing, do I do the cocks? Do I do the puppet plays? (laughs) Tippling, possibly. (laughs) Whatever that is. Um, Yes, and so I think part of the reason that Charles II was there was, obviously, to show a bit of a public face during this national crisis. He donated £2,000 towards a fund to help the poor of London. But it was also to have fun. Kings just want to have fun. Kings just want to have fun. (laughs) I've been cooped up in my castle too long. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, apparently they held an ox roast on the ice, which again, I'm like, guys, you're on ice. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Stop it setting things on, on fire. fire. <laughs> but he also partook in one of the more unusual attractions, and I would say one of the more wholesome ones. The same diary of John Evelyn describes this genius who set up a, quote, printing press where the people yes. and ladies, people and ladies, <laughs> took a fancy to have their names printed. Actually, kind of like what they did in the Eiffel Tower when that opened. Yeah. Um, and the day and the year set down where printed on the Thames. This humour took so universally that it was estimated that the printer gained five pounds a day for printing a line only at sixpence a name. And number one Frost Fair fan, Charles II, was among those who had their names printed, along with his wife, Catherine, and his brother, the Duke of York. They paid their sixpence to have their name printed on the Thames. It's kind of like a penny press machine, isn't it? Mm. In the sense that it's not just the souvenir and it's not just that it's got your name on it. It's the very device itself is the novelty, the printing press. Like the fact that someone's printing a thing, <laughs> that in itself is incredible. Yeah. You would travel yeah. across the country to see someone print something. Yeah, the fact like... that it's then on the ice and the thing they're printing is, you were on the ice and saw this printed. <laughs> Must have been incredible. It's like a VR headset yeah, on the yeah, frozen yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Well, it's quite hard to square, in a way, all of those wholesome parts of the, the fair with oh, where are you gonna no. take the that? rather less wholesome bits, which was that it seems like there was a lot of sex work going on in this fair. <laughs> and I don't know how you brought your children down to check out the good, fun bear baiting and like... Dutch whimsy. Dutch whimsy. And you take Fox a ride on the Dutch whimsy apart. while dad goes in that town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think maybe some of it can be explained by the fact that there were loads of pop-up pubs. This just seems like something mm. that's weirdly modern, you know, yes. all these out-of-work watermen. How like, sure does I'll this whole thing seem? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> like, literally, like barbers on the ice turned up. <laughs> it was a trendy thing to do, wasn't it? There was also a lottery booth, you know, another relatively yeah. new attraction, and an ice skating rink where apparently a Dutchman, I don't know why the Dutch were absolutely going to town, I guess because you know, they were used to ice skating on like the frozen canals, but there was a Dutchman who performed trick skating that you could watch as well. Nice. There was also nine pin bowling and there was a coffee house so you could sit down in the cafe as well and watch your, watch your kids on the nine pin bowling. There was so much good food to be had as well <laughs> and that's astonishing considering what an absolutely bleak winter it was, but you could get turkey rabbit, goose, and then some other things that I wasn't quite so clear on. What's sack that comes with the goose? I think that's like horrible wine. Is it? Right? Okay. I oh, sack I is see. like cheap yeah, wine. Like, yeah. mm. uh, wooden jack. Anyone for wooden jack and hot codlins? Oh, <laughs> they're hot, also hot codlins were there. <laughs> <laughs> this makes it sound like they're a cover band I'm or something. Excited. Yeah, hot codlins. Don't you remember that was the song by Grimaldi? Oh, Do you remember yes. it was like a musical song? Oh, yeah, right. but I can't oh, remember what I've been drinking hot codlin. <laughs> yeah, it's something to do with yeah. gin, I think. Yeah, well, that goes yeah. a long way yeah. back. Type spirit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're wondering why this happened a lot then and doesn't happen now, it's because actually the period between 1300 and 1870 is known by climate scientists as a little ice age mm. uh, when England had very low temperatures, lower than is normal, which must have been really miserable. I mean, I know... I know technically now climate change is terribly bad, you know, that we're having longer summers and warmer winters, but it's more pleasant to live through in England than this would have been, you know. It, it, and coupled with the fact that it was freezing cold and everything was miserable and all the trade routes were closed, there was also a massive outbreak of smallpox at this time, which, as we discussed a few weeks ago, was not fun. So you had this bacchanalian feel was probably partly just a release from all of that. These are people that had not seen sunlight and were riddled with pox. Do you reckon that was all of the deniers saying, A, <laughs> the climate's not changing, and B, I'm not getting the smallpox vaccine? <laughs> Give me a cup of hot codlin. Yeah. <laughs> and so since then, I mean, there have been milder winters. That's one thing. But also the construction of the new London Bridge. So the old London Bridge had quite narrow arches, which meant that the a frost would sort of bank up against it and then it would freeze solid. And these had wider arches, so that was less likely. Also, the embankments of the Thames made the river narrower and deeper. A lot of this also relied on the fact that the river was wide and shallow. And I find that so wild to think about. Yeah. Imagine London built around a Thames that didn't have stone embankments on the river. Like, mm. this really shallow, sprawling <laughs> thing. The last proper frost fair took place in 1814 when thousands of people turned out to see an elephant walk across the frozen river. What a time. A he was having a great time. Yeah, and they're like, hey, <laughs> better him than me. And so ends another curious moment from history. Subscribe now to hear more from Arian, Rebecca, and Ollie, the Retrospectors. Retrospectors.